Hey y'all, hey, it's JJ Conway. Welcome to Building Wealth Together, where our goal is to help you walk in abundance and leave a legacy. It's Wealth Building Wednesday, where we answer your money questions with style and grace. To ask your question, go to buildingwealthtogether.com and click Ask JJ, or leave a voicemail at one 4 ask jjc Let's get into it. All right, first question. We have a family of five, $35,000 of credit card debt, 200,000 student loan debt, have 100,000 in a 401k and a paid off older minivan. Primary income is 95,000. Spouse stays at home taking care of youngest child and after school care, okay? They are also in the process of relocating this summer, which is gonna cause some extra expenses for the move. And paying for a move and doing that successfully is a whole another segment on a podcast, right? Like maybe we should get somebody in there. The moving industry has definitely degraded a lot over the last couple of years. And so be very, very careful. Make sure you get your quotes and things up front. And, you know, if possible, you know, consider moving yourself or consider downsizing the amount of stuff that you have to make it easier to move with less cost and less damage. You know, even even the carriers that have the full insurance and stuff, I found it to be very difficult to recover the cost of things. So, you know, there is there there are some concerns there and definitely find somebody in your area that has done a successful move and can recommend a quality mover moving company to help you out if you're not doing it yourself. All right. We did most of our last move ourselves, and I'm so glad we did. Um, it was the first one that I didn't have to file a claim on. <laughs> All right, but regarding the debt, okay, so when I look at these numbers, I know I know it sounds like a lot, but with an income of $95,000, if you could drop your living expenses down to about 50000 which is an average income lifestyle for many families in the in, in many parts of the United States. And I don't know exactly where you're moving to or from. Uh, both of the locations they gave me in this here, which I'm not naming just to protect their their um, their identity. Uh, both of the locations that you gave me have expensive areas and cheap areas. Okay. So I don't know which ones you're moving to, you know? Um, so like I'm I'm in I'm in Texas right now. Our our house here is, you know, worth maybe a hundred thousand dollars. It's not worth much. But you take this same house and put it in Dallas, it would be worth like seven hundred, you know, on the same amount of land. It would be worth about seven hundred, right? So so you know, that's an hour and a half away. So I mean, it just depends on where you're going and where you're where you're living and what your requirements are gonna be. But I think most families, even a family of five, can get their living expenses down in most areas of the country down to about 50,000. And let me just do a quick calculation here. If you were able to free up that $45,000 with your total debt being uh, 235, if you were to get that down to your income, yeah, you could be, if you could free up $45,000, so you could really scrimp and save for the next four or five years, then you would be completely debt-free. And you would be completely debt-free on a lifestyle of 50000 a year. You would be completely debt-free while still adding to, you know, um, while, while not having taken away from your 401k, okay? So I was, I was about to say that the wrong way, so I want to make sure I say it the right way because I don't know if I'll be able to edit that out easily without it sounding choppy. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't keep adding to your 401k at this point. I would really throw everything at knocking out the debt because if you've got that much of a 401k that tells me you've been putting some significant amount of income in there and you could make this big debt go away even faster, okay? But just, just with an average lifestyle, and I mean, you could do so much more with a beans and rice, you know, uh, nuclear explosion, we are doing nothing fun for the next four years. I mean, you could probably knock this out in, 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 in you could probably knock this out in three and a half years. I mean, completely debt free. I mean, wouldn't that be awesome? Right. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't tear into the 401k to do this. Okay. But I, I think you have it in your budget that you should be able to do this. So let's talk about the student loans real quick because $200,000 of student loans is pretty significant. Usually when people come to me with this much student loans, they're doing, um, they, they went to law school or med school or something of that kind of profession. And then they realize that that's not what they want to do or they did, but they're still early in their career. So they're not making enough money to really, um, 
pay that back the way they want. I will say that for anybody who's got a high student loan, when you first graduate from college and you first get out there and, and, and you're, you're struggling, you're struggling, you're struggling, and then you get that first good job, okay, I would resist the urge to increase your lifestyle. I would seriously pay off the student loans. And I know a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, there's these programs and in 10 years, the government will pay it off or the county will pay it off or the state will pay it off. I have had friends in those programs at the state level and then a new governor comes in and cancels all of it. And I've seen client after client after client who endured the toxicity and the headache of teaching or nursing or social working in a specific unhappy environment because they thought they were going to get their loans paid off. And 10 years later, they submit their application and it doesn't get approved. I think the stat is that only 1% of people in any of these kinds of uh, government funded loan forgiveness programs, only about 1% of people ever actually get them paid off. And you can't, you can't afford to risk your family's future to maybe be one of those 1%. Take charge of your own future and get it done now. And, I'm, and, and I understand that somebody asked me the other day as I was doing my, my medical appointments, they're like, well, you know, I have all these medical loans and, 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 you know, what if, you know, I feel like, why should I keep scrimping and saving to pay it off? Because they're talking about paying off everybody's loans. Well, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. And I, and I do, I know how that feels. Cause I, I know when they did the, 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 um, oh, what was it called? The, it was an act when the market, when the real estate market crashed, all the military who had VA loans and, or FHA loans, if you moved to another base and your house was upside down, the government came in and paid the difference to forgive your loan so that you could sell your house. Well, I had um, the house that me and my ex-husband had bought. We bought it with a conventional loan because a conventional loan saves you money over a VA loan if you could put 10 or 20% down. And so we finally had gotten to the financial point where we could put that level of money down on a $400,000 house, right? And then the market crashed and that 405,000 that we paid of uh, the, the loan that we took for the, for the property was 405. Um, then the house itself was only worth 180. <laughs> and I tried and tried and tried to apply for all these programs that everybody else was getting. And they were like, no, because you took a conventional loan. That's not a government backed loan. It had to be a government backed loan. So I understand that was a $220,000, you know, wow, that could have really been a help for me. And I understand how I felt, how frustrated I was that I couldn't get the help that other service members could get. Right. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you don't know what assistance is coming and you don't know if it's going to help you and you don't know if it's going to help you, but is it going to come at the cost of something else? But at these numbers here, you know, you can be out of debt in four or five years. And you could probably be out of debt in three years with a serious scrimping and saving. And if I had the choice of waiting around and, or if I had the choice of taking care of my future now, I'm taking care of my future now. And, and not only am I taking care of my future now, but even after I get out of debt, I'm relaxing a little bit, but I'm throwing as much as possible into investments for the next couple of years because, hey, we haven't been needing it. We haven't lived off of that full income. Let's, let's siphon that away before we get used to living on that higher income, you know, and, and some people, you know, some people have really um, kind of laughed at that, but I'll tell you what, I'm fully retired. I do this business because I enjoy it. I enjoy helping people and I charge people because I know that they are more invested when they pay. Right. You know, so I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have to do this. You know, I, I don't, if I don't feel like working for the summer, I'm, I'm not going to work for the summer, you know, I, and, and that's a position you can be in when you learn how to live on little, but live in abundance, or when you learn how to invest so that you have enough investments, throwing off enough passive income that you can live on. Both of those situations lead you to that point called enough where your passive income covers your living expenses. And that's where I want people to get. And if you can knock out this debt, if you can tighten your belt and knock out this debt, not only will you be changing your financial future, but you will be sending a very strong message into the lives of your children that will, generally speaking, help their financial future. All right. Great question. Great question. We're soon to be newlywed and trying to combine tons of debt while providing for our future. Oh, how lovely. I remember being so excited about getting married and, and, um, 
it's funny. I didn't think of it this way at the time, but two of my mentors, Greg and Julie Gorman, they wrote this book called Married for a Purpose about how uh, couples, we, we're not just two individuals doing our thing, but there's a reason the Lord brought us together and allowed us to become together and, and really do something powerful as a couple. And, and I love that thought. And, and that's, that's a process that I'm going through right now is trying to figure out, okay, Lord, what is it that you have for our purpose as a couple? I know what my purpose as an individual is, but how does that align with his purpose and how are we aligned together for a purpose? Right. And so I just love that. I just love that. Um, I'm going to attack this question from two ways. One, we're going to talk about combining finances and planning to be married and then how to do those initial budget meetings after marriage. And the other thing I'm going to talk about is debt. And so attacking debt doesn't change whether you're married or single. It's the same process, okay? Um, but what but what the difference that makes when we're married is now we are responsible to another person. And I don't know when they say soon to be newlywed uh, and, and providing for the future. I don't know if this is a first marriage, if these are, you know, young adults out of college, or if this is a first marriage and these are folks in their forties, you know, I've, I've seen that happen before. Um, I don't know if this is a third or fourth marriage and you're in your sixties or seventies or something like that. You know, I really don't know what they're at. I imagine when they talk about providing for the future, that they're going to be on the younger end of the scale, which means they have a long time. They would probably have a longer time horizon. It, 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 it may also mean that they do or don't have certain inhibitions. And so the very first thing that I'm going to recommend is to be able to talk to each other. No kidding about your finances. Show the bank statements, show the credit card statements if you have any credit cards. Okay. And the reason I see that is because whether you're starting off and you're worried about impressing your future mate or whether you've got some scar tissue like me, sometimes it's really easy to fall into this, this thing of, well, we're together and everything else, but we don't, we don't need to talk about money, right? And I'm going to tell on myself a little bit here. Um, I don't think I've actually talked about this publicly, but uh, when I remarried, I thought – I. <laughs> And, I, and this is so against what I normally teach, but I had so much scar tissue from my first marriage where I ended up having to clean up over $800,000 of debt. I just didn't want to get in that situation again. I just didn't want to get into being taken advantage of again. I knew I made more than my soon-to-be husband, and I just didn't want that to skew our relationship. You know, like I had all these fears. I had all these fears. And so we get married in December and the next tax season, my accountant's like, well, you're not going to fire. I'm like, oh, let's file, let's file married filing separately. Right. I hadn't, I hadn't gone through financial planning. I hadn't gone to school, um, the CFP certifi certification schooling yet. So I didn't understand how taxes worked then the way I do now. Um, but <laughs> I was doing financial coaching, but I was doing financial coaching as a um, financial coach, not as a financial planner. And so I didn't have the education then. And, and so I'm like, yeah, we'll just do married filing, filing separately. And she's like, you can't do that. You make too much money. You're going hit, to get hit with all these penalties, you know, if you're doing, you know, this and this and that and that. And she walked me through it and I was like, oh, I really, because we, we, because we were in separate states when we got married, I really, this is so bad. This is so bad. I really thought we were going to get all the way to my military retirement before we moved in together. And then I was going to have to deal with, you know, showing expenses, but by then I wasn't going to be making any money anymore because I was going to be retired. Right. Like that was the big brain plan. Right. And that was like, I was like, that's not how you start a marriage. So I feel so bad for my poor husband because I think when we filed the first tax thing together, I think that was really eye opening. And I remember feeling like, I remember feeling so small because even though, even though I teach um, B, B1, I, this was an area of my life where I had taken a very long time and I had worked very, very hard to get out of debt. And I wasn't about to let anybody else ever put me back into debt. And, and so when we, when we start off in our, when we start off, sometimes we don't talk about these things because we don't know we need to, but later in life, when we, when we remarry or we get married for the first time, that scar tissue can cause us to make decisions that aren't necessarily the best foundation for our future marriage. Okay. And so, you know, that's a lack of trust that has to be rebuilt. And so, you know, don't do what I did. Right. And, and I'm like, I'm explaining you the impact so that you don't do what I did. Right. Um, but in this case, I would really, no kidding, get the credit reports, get the bank statements and sit down and say, this is where we're at. And then I would sit down and say, this is where we want to be. 
Now, I would create a plan to get from point A to point B, but until you're married, I really do recommend that each of you attack your own debt and each of you follow your own plan until you're actually married. And then when you're married, then you guys can prioritize or take care of each other's debt or however you want to work that. But I wouldn't do all of that until you're actually married. I would come up with the plan. I would come up with the, I would do the exercise of coming up with the plan. I would do the exercise of sitting down together and planning a budget. I would do that exercise as an exercise in preparation for becoming a married couple, but I wouldn't actually conjoin funds until you guys are actually married. Okay. So, so that's the newlyweds combining thing. Okay. And you can sit down with a fee only financial planner like me that would help you craft that plan if you have some struggles, but I'm actually going to give you a wedding gift. I'm going to give you my 28 days to financial freedom boot camp. Every day you'll get a different exercise that will help you and your future intended walk through this process of understanding how money works, understanding why it's important to have savings, understanding debt and the cost of debt on your future and why you want to pay it off so that you can be committed when, you know, when something awesome comes up and you want to buy that instead of getting out of debt, right? Like you want to understand all these things. And my 28 days to financial freedom boot camp will absolutely help you do that. So go ahead and reach out to me and I will send you a link to that. Uh, absolutely no charge. Okay. It's a $99 course. I'm going to gift that, gift that to you for your wedding gift. All right. Now, getting out of debt itself is a very simple process. It's simple, not easy, all right? And so what we do, what I recommend is I recommend that everybody be insulated. They put on a little bit of protection against the ups and downs of life with a starter emergency fund. Then I recommend people be debt-free, and this is where you really will have to attack that debt, and we come up with a plan to do that. Most of the time, the plan is going to be to pay, to pay off the smallest debt first, and throw everything you can at it, knock it out, and then roll that money into the next smallest debt, pay everything you can at it, knock it out, right? Like those are the, those are the ways we will progress most of the time. That's what I'm going to recommend. And then after you've knocked out debt, then we start looking at protecting against your future. We make sure that you've got a fully funded emergency account. We look at, we look more in depth at the areas of risk that you're taking on. I mean, we look at that a little bit in, in the beginning of, of a financial coaching relationship, but sometimes, um, sometimes the goals and needs and things that emerge while you're paying off debt are better to inform this. So we really tweak that later on and we make sure that you start investing and, and given your personality, there's a lot of different ways to make money grow. You can invest in the stock market, you, you know, mutual funds, you can invest in real estate, you can invest in all kinds of things, really. And so we talk about some of those things and we talk about your needs and what you're going to need and what kind of accounts to put them in. OK, but the very, very, very foundation is one, insulate yourself with a little starter emergency fund that will protect you from the, you know, the car tire going out, the check engine light coming on, this or that that happens in life so that you don't have to keep going back into debt. And then we throw everything else at debt. Okay. That's the basic plan and you can totally do it. All right. And the cool thing about it is if you can knock out debt early in your marriage, and you can take the money you were spending towards debt and start investing it, you will see your investment income and your, your investment results skyrocket later in life. This is how you plan for your future. And this is how you preserve your future. And this is how you make sure you're going to have a great future. Okay. Great question. All right. Last question for this session. My husband and I are both 63. Yeah, this is the last question, right? Okay. Last question for this session. My husband and I are both 63. We want to retire at 65. If we sell our house, we wouldn't have money for a down payment on a condo, which is what we want. Should we sell the house and rent for a year or save for a down payment? Okay, so there's some there's some typos in the middle there. I think they're wondering if they should save the house and rent while they're saving for a down payment. Either way, I think you probably need to save for a down payment. Before I say whether that's best done through selling your house versus living. In many, many, many places, you're going to have a cheaper cost of living by renting than selling. OK, and in almost every case, if the house you're living in isn't the house. Wait a second. Let me rephrase that. 
in most cases, if you're renting I wouldn't tell you go buy a house that you don't want to be in long term just to save a couple hundred dollars a month. Okay, so that's not what I'm trying to imply with what I'm about to say. But in some markets, so, for example, when I was stationed at Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana, you could rent in this one neighborhood for a thousand dollars a month or you could buy a house in that neighborhood for six hundred a month mortgage. So in that area, it was much cheaper to buy a property than to rent a property okay the even even when we bought our house in louisiana we did it partially because with the size of our family there was there were no there were no places to rent that were cheaper than buying but you know buying a house buying a house comes with a whole lot of things so for this particular individual they are already in a house I, whether I wouldn't recommend they buy a temporary house if they know they ultimately want a condo, but they're already in a house. So I would want them to evaluate, are they really going to save some money by moving into a rental? And it may not be that they save any money, but maybe they save a lot of the home ownership headaches in time and energy and, and the maintenance and the upkeep of the house. Okay. So buying a house isn't just buying a house. It's not, it's it's not a um it's not a rent and mortgage apples to apples comparison. Okay. So when you're renting, some payments include your your utilities. They include your gas or your water or your trash. Some things that you rent, whether you're renting a house or an apartment, some of them include uh, a lot of the infrastructure. But when you have a house that you've purchased, then you have a lot of those infrastructure things. You've got to mow the grass or pay somebody to do it, right? You've got to, you know, when our when our when our street light went out, our neighborhood didn't have community street lights. Everybody had their own street light in their house, a little decorative post light. Well, when that thing, when ants got in there and built a nest in there and ate up all the wiring, guess who had to pay for that, right? That was, <laughs> so, um, you know, there are a lot of those kinds of little things that go into home ownership. And it can be a lot on your body and it can be a lot on your pocketbook. And, and there's a lot of freedom with having a house. Don't get me wrong. I love living in a house. I don't ever want to go back to, to living in an apartment again. I mean, I did for eight years while I was, uh, while I was divorced and, and climbing out of $800,000 of debt, but I'm so glad I don't have to do that anymore. Right. I'm so glad that money affords me the ability to live in a house. And so, um, with land, with a little bit of land. Right. And so, um, what, what I would say is this is not a straight, easy answer. It really depends on the situation. So it's going to depend on, will dropping to an apartment free up cash flow? If yes, then that might be a great reason. Will moving to an apartment not free up cash flow, but it frees up body strength, time, and mental energy? Then yes, that may be a good thing to do because now you have body strength and energy to go do something else to help you build up a down payment faster. Okay, so can you see all the interconnectedness here? It's not just a simple answer. You know. It could be a simple answer, but it, but it's not just a simple answer. And so that's that's the first thing that I would say with this couple here. Before you sell your house, let's make sure that's really going to help you get where you want to go. Or is it just moving one problem to another? But if it is going to save you, if it's going to open up cash flow that you can use to save for down payment, that's a great thing, right? If it's going to save for you up time and energy and capacity in your life, capacity in your body, capacity in your mental reserves to be able to do that down payment and move forward in your life, then absolutely okay. But 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 don't think I'm gonna sell this house and now I'm gonna rent this apartment that's actually two hundred dollars more and I'm going to still build up a down payment. Like you have to analyze the numbers. And then the other thing that I would say with this particular question is when you go into a condo, please, please, please remember that condos generally have condo fees. And you want to research when moving into a condo, you want to research what those condo fees are and what's included. So there was one when I was when I was um, stationed in Northern Virginia, we were living in a townhome, about $1,800 a month rent. And I was thinking we were going to stay there. And I'm glad now that the Lord told me no, because I didn't know I was going to get pregnant in my 40s, right? Like I I totally thought I was, my, I thought the shop was closing up, right? And I'd already lost four babies. So I had no intention 
even when I remarried, I was always very clear with every date. I am not having more kids. That's just, I'm not going through that mental anguish of trying to have another child. Right. And then, and then Cubby just comes along and you're like, I mean, y'all, it took me five months to even think that I was really going to have this baby because of my history and my medical history and the other things that had happened in my body. I just didn't even believe it. Like I really do consider him my second miracle child. Right. And so, um, you know, I was looking, but, but before I knew I was pregnant, I was looking for condos. And, you know, I found a great condo, you know, $150,000, you know, in Northern Virginia. And I was so excited about it because my payment was going to go down from my rent. But <laughs> the condo fees were like $900 to $1,200 a month, depending on <laughs> what you had. I'm like, well, that, 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 that shifts the process, right? Like, uh, that's, that's a different calculation because now, now I'm looking at paying $2,200 a month instead of the $1,500 or the $1,800 I was paying to rent here. So, you know, you got to look at all those things and you got to understand what's included. Some condos include all your utilities. Some condos include parking, some don't. It, you really got to take a look at where you're at. So you make sure that you're comparing apples to apples, not apples to oranges. All right. And that's something I can help you with. If you were to engage me as your financial planner or your financial coach, I could certainly help you go through all the numbers and make sure that you're getting what you need to get so that you can get where you want to go. All right. That's all I've got for y'all today. You take care and be blessed. Love the podcast? Be sure to like, subscribe, and forward three friends. You can ask a question or take a life-changing class at buildingwealthtogether.com. Now, go walk in abundance and leave a legacy.